Good morning. Hey, give yourselves a round of applause for getting here in the rain at a 10 o'clock service on Sunday. We acknowledge it's not always easy to do that, and we appreciate the opportunity to worship alongside of you. Uh, we are continuing this series. In fact, it's one of the last weeks. We'll either conclude today or next Sunday, depending on the whims of the pastor. Um, Last night, uh, I was driving on the way here to the rehearsal to help us with our projector, and so thanks to Bruno and Orfe for helping us get all that done. Looks great, because that looks amazing. And it was dark. It was about six o'clock at night. It was getting darker. It was raining, and I was having trouble seeing because of the rain, because it was getting dark. I always find this time of year, it's like your eyes are trying to adjust, and for some reason, I always find this time of year a difficult time to drive. And what I discovered in that few minutes as we drove from NDG up here to this church is that I was grateful for my windshield wipers. And, you know, when you're driving, clarity is so important, isn't it? If you've been on the highway in the, in the slush in the wintertime or in a rainstorm at dark and at dusk, windshield wipers can literally save your life and the lives of those that you're driving against, right? It feels like you're in a competition sometimes. So clarity is so important. It's important when you're driving. Clarity is so important when you're dating. Isn't that true? Is this just a hookup or is this something has long-term promise? And you don't have to look at the partner beside you to understand that, right? Clarity is important when you're driving. Clarity is important when you're dating. Clarity is important for your parenting. Clarity is important for your finances. And today, I want to help us clarify why it is that the Christian faith is so important. And this passage that we're going to read today is arguably, arguably one of the most important passages in the whole Bible about the clarity of God's love, about the problem of sin and the pervasiveness of sin, the slipperiness of sin, if I could say it that way. God's love, sin, and God's grace. This passage is a beloved passage, and it is an opportunity to really transform our understanding. Without exaggeration, this passage has saved marriages. This passage has saved parents and kids. This passage has literally saved lives from those who have suicide ideation. And so with a lot of promise, right, this passage is incredibly important. This passage has been described as, if you picture the scriptures as a beautiful lake that you're looking at, this particular passage that we're going to look at today together is like that one place in the lake where you can see all the way to the bottom. This passage clarifies the grace of God, the love of God, and the problem of sin, unlike probably any other passage of Scripture. And because of the weight of everything I just said, can we bow for a moment? Because I know, as Yancey said, some of us have struggles and, and worries and anxieties that's going to prevent us from fully listening. And for those, those of us here today, this message is slippery. It's easy for us to say, yeah, I got this. And in fact, Jesus is going to address that. And so can we bow for a moment and ask that God would wake us up, that he would give us a shot of spiritual caffeine, open up our hearts, open up our minds, open up our hearts to the possibilities of understanding the gospel, the beautiful gospel, the good news of Jesus in a way that we've never understood before. Does that sound good? Father, we bow. We bow our hearts. We bow our heads. We bow our eyes. We ask that you would fill us with your wisdom. We ask that you would open up our hearts to, uh, to understand the depth, the height, the, the riches of your love in a way that we've never fully grasped before. God, this, su this subject truly is slippery. It's easy for us to miss it. And so I pray that your words would come through, that my words would fall to the floor and it would be your words that we hear today. God, open up our eyes, open up our hearts, and I pray that we would all leave transform, fully in love with you and fully understanding the grace of God that is available to us in Christ Jesus. And we pray this in your name, amen. So let's go together to look at a passage that talks about the love of God. A story about two sons who had two very different approaches to get happiness. A father with two sons who had two sons, sorry, a father with two sons who had very different opposite, you might say, approaches of how to be happy, how to live the good life, how to do everything that we're trying to do, how to be happy, how to have a good life. These two sons exemplify two very different approaches to do that. We're going to be together in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11. Luke 15. You can follow along on your smartphone or on the screen behind me. If you are of the Portuguese persuasion or Spanish persuasion or 
Francais, persuasion, you can follow along on your own language. Well, maybe one day we'll have an opportunity to put all the languages up there. It might take a lot of slides. Let's listen together. This is this story. This is the parable of Jesus. Again, it's, the, it's one of the few passages of Scripture where we can see all the way to the bottom. May God give us grace to understand together. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. Not, longer, not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had. He set off to a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed, to feed pigs. He longed, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. The son says to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and now is found. And so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the other son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called to one of his servants and he asked him what was going on. Oh, your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and he refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with them. But the older brother answered his father, look, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But, but when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, my son, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the story of Jesus. This is the word of the Lord for us today. Before we say amen, which brother are you in the story? And before you answer too quickly, most church people are the older brother. Most church people, in fact, in the audience of Jesus, why he told this whole story to begin with, and if you go back, I would love for you to spend your afternoon pausing Netflix and instead open up Luke 15. Do me a favor, spend 30 minutes on this chapter. Because in the first part of the chapter, he talks about three stories, a lost coin, something else, was a lost sheep, a lost sheep, a lost coin, and then the two sons. And this passage has been wrongly described as the parable of the prodigal son. In fact, it's the parable of the prodigal God or the parable of the prodigal father. Because this story is actually not about the prodigal son. It's not about the older son. It's about God. It's about the heart of the father. 
And in this audience that Jesus was telling this very story, he was gathered around religious people like us, people that get up early and go to the 10 o'clock service. Now, the 11.30, that's when the younger brothers will show up. You guys are the older brothers. So we can laugh at them because they're sleeping off their hangovers from last night. I'm just kidding. I think mostly. But it's tr- truthfully, I'm not only, I'm, not, I'm, rec- I'm a recovering older brother spiritually, but I'm actually an older brother physically. I have three younger brothers. And as it is physically, a lot of times that lines up spiritually, that those of us who are older brothers and older sisters, raise your hand with a lot of pride. That's where I said all those horrible things about older brothers, right? We are, we are we're amazing, the older brothers and the older sisters. We, we carry a lot of weight in the family. Come on, we are like a surrogate parent to, the, to our parents. We are the bridge from the parents to the kids. Mom was, my mom is here from Ottawa, by the way, in the front row. So I'm, everything I'm saying, she can corroborate. And yeah, we can, we can clap for my mom today. Yeah, yeah. Mom's going to keep me in check today. But uh, mom was a good delegator because she helped me to learn how to change diapers of my younger brothers at times and set a good example. It was always said to me, Christopher, that's what I, and, you know, when she's saying something serious, when I'm in trouble, Christopher, make sure that you do this and do this. Set a good example, Christopher, for your younger brothers. I'm like, okay, mom, I'll do it. And my son Sterling's on the front row and he's an older brother. And then Kingston is the opposite. So just like my brothers, Rob, Stu, and Ted, they got away with a lot of different stuff. They had different bedtimes. I had to go to bed at seven. My younger brothers got to go to bed at 10 o'clock. And it's the same in our family too. Man, we had it rough, don't we, older brothers and sisters? Man, we had it rough. But we also got the first change of clothes. We got the new clothes. We got the new this. We got the energy of our parents. At, at some point, the parents are just like, whatever, get yourself to school. Do your own lunch, right? After a couple of kids, you just wear out. So anyway... I want to I wanna define for us the word prodigal. It's important. And I don't have a slide for this, unfortunately. So you have to really listen carefully. Because when we think about the word prodigal or prodigal son, we think, well, wayward or somebody who messes up, somebody who is, you know, just doing something the wrong way. And actually, what the definition of prodigal is, is this. There's two definitions. It's to be recklessly extravagant. Prodigal means to be recklessly extravagant. Or the second definition to spend until you have nothing left. And so the prodigal son was not prodigal because he was lost and did all those crazy things. He was prodigal because he recklessly was extravagant in the wealth of his father, and he spent until he had literally nothing left. And that's why he had to, as a Jewish person, eat the food and try to eat the food of pigs. Now, it's really difficult for us to understand all the cultural nuances of the story, but this is a Jewish audience that could not be in the presence of pigs. Okay, that's one thing. In the story, it's also essential that as Westerners, that we understand more of an Eastern mindset, a Middle Eastern mindset. And that's imperative to understand why this story was such a dishonor to this father. Now, even as Westerners, as someone from Ottawa or from Montreal or from Canada, we understand that this was very dishonorable to the father. But in an Eastern or a Middle Eastern mindset, For a younger son to say, I want your inheritance now is basically the equivalent of saying, I I prefer that you were dead so I could have your stuff now. That's what he was saying to his dad. I I don't love you. I want your stuff. And what's interesting about this, another part of this story that we have to understand is that in the first century, in this Jewish way of life, in this culture, the older son, again, the younger, you're not going to like this. The older son had two-thirds of the estate, and the younger had one-third of the estate. And so for the father to give his younger prodigal son his estate, he had to sell property. He had to sell off his land and give him that one-third of the estate. And so the two-thirds now belongs to the older brother. So that's important that we understand those nuances before we get deeper into the story. So which brother, which sister are you? Are you the younger, wayward son or daughter, or are you the stay-at-home, faithful son or daughter? It's important that we understand this question. Why, why did Jesus even tell this story? It's, this, is a, this is essential that we understand. Again, he's talking mostly to religious people who are complaining, as they did, of Jesus hanging out with prostitutes and tax collectors and lepers and people on the margins of society. 
Jesus told this story specifically not, listen to me, not to warm our hearts. Jesus told this story to shatter our categories. And that's why this message is so important. All the things I said at the beginning are essential because Jesus is trying to mess with us today. Because we came to church today to get a, a pat on the back and to, to check our list. I know older brothers, we do this. We, we went to church today, check, right? And, and I said so, hi to somebody today. And I served somebody today. Came early today, check, 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 right? We're checklist people in the background of our minds. And Jesus did not tell the story to warm our hearts. He told it to shatter the categories of people like us. So let's, let's get that out of the way. So from this side of the audience, from my friend David, I'm gonna have to divide this family here. So David and Angie, you guys are on opposite teams today. You guys on this side are the runners, okay? So you guys are New Balance runners. So you're sponsored by New Balance. You have power bars for dinner. You go on long runs for 20 miles or 40 kilometers. You leave for Saturday and you're gone for hours and your family's like, maybe I'll see you later. Okay, so you guys are runners. Everybody on this side of the audience, you guys are performers. Okay, so you're singers. Sorry, you're on the top, wrong team, Yancy. So you are, you, are, you, you are about your craft. You are trying to get up to the stage. You're trying to work on your music. You're trying to be really, really perfect because you know you get rewarded. You'll, you'll get accolades if you do the right thing. So you guys are performers. You guys are my runners as we divide the audience. So let's talk about the runners who want to lace them up and go far away. Put on your New Balance running shoes and your jackets and all your power bar stuff inside of your jackets for your, your long runs, okay? You guys are, are wanting to lace them up and get far away, just like the prodigal son. And this, the, the runners here, what you're trying to do is you're trying to gain happiness by being, making your own rules. You're trying to be happy by setting your own rules and finding your own path. It's the path of self-discovery. It's very common what we talk about today with project self is that I want to define what's happiness for me. I want to break the laws of tradition. I want to find myself and free myself and not live under my parents' authority or society's authority or what a pastor says. I want to be free to express myself. And that's really the heart of runners. It's to be happy by breaking with tradition and to express myself as I see fit. Again, the younger brother wants his father's money, but he doesn't want his father. He's asking that his father would die so that he could get his stuff and finally get out from the authority of his father's home and to finally live the life that he's always dreamed of living apart from his dad and brother. The prodigal, the runners, you guys are recklessly extravagant. You're like, don't, don't put that, mom. Yeah, you guys are. You guys are recklessly extravagant with stuff. You just, it comes through you and it goes through before you have a chance to put it into your bank account, right? It's just, it's there and it's gone. You get some calories from breakfast and then you burn it off with a 20 kilometer run. It's gone, recklessly extravagant. And at the end of the story, this, the runners and the prodigal son, he's got nothing left. He burns through millions of dollars in a matter of months and he's left empty, so empty that he's physically beat up. He's got no clothing left. He's got no food. He's got no friendships. He's got no community. He's got no family. He truly is lost, empty, and broken. And that's why he finally comes to his senses, it says. And when we think about the word repentance, which is a very common word in the Bible, we think repentance like somebody's got a bullhorn down on St. Catherine saying, you're going to hell. You need to repent. Do you know what the word repent means? It's to change your mind. It's you're going one direction and then you repent and you go back to where you're supposed to go. The younger brother was going far away from God, far away from his father, and he repents, which means he finally comes to his senses and said, even the servants of my father have more food than I do. I'm gonna at least go back and maybe, just maybe, I can learn an apprentice. I can be, I can be a tradesperson. I can apprentice under one of the carpenters or, or one of the shepherds or something. At least I can start to pay my father back. He repents, he comes home. The other hand, the older brother, in contrast to the runner, he's the performer. And you know where the, the older brother goes? He goes very close to his dad. 
He stays in the field. He never wants to explore the world. He just wants to, if the younger brother, if the runner wants to control the father and control his life by expressing himself and doing whatever he wants to do, the older brother also wants control. He wants to control the outcome by performing. That if I perform well enough, if I look good enough, if I keep myself close enough to the margins and close enough to my father, then I will gain the outcome that I want. And what is so surprising of this story is that neither brother, neither son actually loved the father. Both of them in their own way dishonored this good father. The, the prodigal did it by trying to take the money and spend it recklessly. And on the other hand, the older brother tried to control or manipulate his father by being good, by staying close, by being moral, by being tradition focused. It's a very hard concept for us to understand. The performers, they wanna get it right. They wanna hit all the right notes. They wanna get the applause. If the younger brother wants to get control by self-expression, the older brother wants to get control through his performance. And what's fascinating in our current culture today, maybe you've heard of cancel culture. Have you heard of that? Cancel culture. You know what's really interesting about that? Everybody driving that on social media and particularly on Twitter or X or whatever you call it these days. Now, I'm glad that people have a voice. I'm glad that people that are doing bad things are getting found out. I'm, I'm really glad about that. But there is an angry cancel culture engine and it's fueled by older brothers. And if you ask these people that are driving these hashtags and driving this whole movement of cancel this person and cancel that person and cancel that person, they are religious people who are not religious. They are just trying to tell everybody who's right and who's wrong, not looking at themselves in the mirror, but saying this person's bad, this person's bad, take their wealth away, take their influence away, take their status away. It's an angry mob of religious people who, if you ask them honestly, they would say, I'm not religious, but they have this older brother spirit of saying, I'm right and they're wrong. Cancel culture, very fascinating situation. Older brothers are angry, Older brothers are exhausted. Older brothers want to do everything to look good. And it's like running on a treadmill. You're running and you're sweating and you're getting more tired, but you're not going anywhere. And the older brothers within us, within me, we have this joyless, sacrificial duty attitude towards our families, oftentimes towards God. And if you've ever been to a dead and a lifeless church, you know what the reason for that? It's because it's filled with older brothers and older sisters. Jo joylessly performing religious rituals without the heart of God. Going through the motions of what they're supposed to do or how they were trained to do or how their parents did, but having no heart, no connection, just going through the duties because if they check the box of going to church, if they check the box of giving, if they check the box of going to a small group, they think internally, well, God then has to owe me something. God owes me a good life. God owes me a baby. God owes me a spouse. God owes me a house. God owes me a freedom from trials and, and temptations. You see how that can get messy really quick? Because the whole goal for the older brother in the story is to control the father through his actions. Both the runner and the performer dishonored their father. The younger by waywardly, recklessly spending everything. And on the other hand, the older brother dishonoring their father by saying, in this very story, you know how we, you know how we responded to the father's love? The father came to him and said, look, everything I have is yours. And what's interesting is that literally was true. Everything, because he had divided his inheritance, everything literally belonged to the older brother, including the animal, including the party that he was throwing. And the older brother responds to the compassion of his father and said, look, your, your prodigal son, your prodigal brother, he was dead. And now he's alive. He was lost. 
And, and now he's found, th this is how we do it in the McGregor house. We celebrate when someone who's lost is found. We, we celebrate when someone was dead who's now alive. You know how the older brother responds to the compassion, the grace, the love of his father? He says, look. And again, if you're from that Middle Eastern or you're from that Eastern mindset, if you just say, look, not yes, sir, or dear father, look, man, or expletive, right? Look, I have slaved for you. Do you notice that? I have always done what you've told me to do. I have always been close to you. I have always done the hard work. I have always gotten up on time. This son of yours, do you notice what he said? He says, look to his honorable father. And then he says, this son of yours, not my brother Kingston, not my best brother, as my boys were saying to each other growing up, not his name, look, this son of yours. It reveals the heart of older brothers. It reveals this pain that this father has to deal with these two wayward sons. And I think we're starting to round out why it is that it's so slippery for us to really understand the story and what Jesus is trying to get across. So again, I say to you, are you the runner? Are you, are you, are you decked out in New Balance right now? Are you a Power Gel subscriber? Or are you a performer, going through the religious motions and trying to make sure that God owes you because you're so moral, so good, so Christian. And I can say that because I'm a recovering performer. I was literally a runner, but in this story, I am the performer. Okay. Tim Keller, and by the way, before I go any further, I don't want to forget to do this. This book literally has changed my life. It's called The Prodigal God, Recovering the Heart of the Christian Faith. It is 152 pages, very easy to read. This has the potential to shape your heart, shape your marriage, shape your parenting, and shape your perspective of God, just like this story. And so if you want more information, if you want to see how I ripped off all of his ideas, you can read it for yourself. Out of this book, Tim Keller says this. I want you on this side of the audience, because I know you guys, you guys are the, the runners. This is, you don't struggle with this at all. Okay, so this is your side of the room, all right? If, listen to this, this is a really important quote. If, like the older brother, you believe that God, listen to that word, ought. If you believe that God ought to bless you and help you because you have worked so hard to obey him and to be a good person, then Jesus may be your helper, your example, even your inspiration, but he is not your savior. Oof. If you believe that because you did this and you did this and you did this and you did this, then God owes you something, then he might be your inspiration, he might be your example, but he is not your savior. You, listen to this, this is so important, this next statement. You are serving as your own savior. You're your own savior. Why? Because sin, this, is, this whole quote is fire, but this is a very important definition because when we think about sin, we think about the runners, don't we? Cocaine, prostitutes, sex, drug, and rock and roll. And it's, it is that. But the, slippery, the slipperiness of sin is much more difficult to see. And it's to actually see into our hearts of the motivation of why we do what we do. It's the motivation why we worship, why we gather on Sundays, why we serve, why we give. It's the heart that Jesus said is the most important, okay? So why? Why are we serving as our own savior? Because sin is not just breaking the rules. It's not the cocaine only. It's not the alcohol only. It's not this, this, and this. That all the things that we could name, a hundred of them. It's not just breaking the rules. Listen to this so carefully. It is putting yourself in the place of God as savior. Lord and judge. Just as each son sought to displace the authority of the father in his own life. Do you see that? Jesus told a story about two kinds of people with two very different visions of happiness. One who tried to get happiness by self-expressing himself and one by worshiping himself. 
One by looking on the outside like he had done everything as Jesus asked him to do, but not doing it out of his heart of worship or not doing it out of gratitude, but simply trying to get God to owe him something or his father to owe him something. Look, this son of yours, you never even gave me a goat to celebrate. And I haven't had goat lately, but apparently that's a delicacy in the first century, right? I never even got a goat. But when this son of yours, again, not my brother, when this wayward son of yours came home, he got a feast. In the first century, it was very rare to have meat, perhaps three times a year, four times a year. In the McGregor house, we do it differently. We have lots of meat. John Ortberg, a pastor in California, says this, and this is another helping us to, to refine the word prodigal. The word prodigal is not waywardness. The prodigal is someone who is recklessly spending everything to the max, okay? John Orprig says this. This is the story of a father whose heart is extravagant, wasteful. This father is wasteful and extreme and willing to spend all of his money to throw a party for his rebellious younger son, the younger son and the father have something in common. Listen to this. They are both lavish. One with money. What does that next part say? And the other with grace. And that's why the story is not the prodigal son. It's the prodigal father. The prodigal son was wasteful with money and the prodigal father was wasteful with his grace. You see, God's grace is free but it's not cheap. It cost his one and only son to die on the cross to be executed for us. Amen? Grace is not free. Grace, excuse me, grace is free, but it's not cheap. Listen to this next part. We belong to a spendthrift, God, who foolishly, lavishly, wastefully spends his grace on people like you. Yeah, and people like me who do not deserve it, who cannot earn it, and can never pay him back. That's the definition of a bad investment, to give money to someone who can't pay you back. Never lend money to family, and never lend money to someone who can't pay you back. Those are two good rules of money. We're going to talk about that in November. So God is lavishly, wasteful with his grace, spending it extravagantly on people like you, the runners, and you, the performers, and yeah, pastors like me. People who do not deserve it, cannot earn it, can never pay him back, all that he can say to us, listen to this, this is the heartbeat of God. This is the heartbeat of your father in heaven. Welcome home, son. Welcome home, daughter. That's why Jesus was commissioned to pay with his life, with his death, so that you who are far off could be brought home. Welcome home, son. Welcome home, daughter. Welcome home, addict. Welcome home, abuser. Welcome home this. Welcome home that. I've missed you so much. The father is rich, and he is prodigal with his grace. Do you see how this story, it's not about the son. It's not about the older son. It's about the heart of the father. And the more Jesus taught, the more people were confused because it was the Pharisees of the day, the people who got it right, who wore the right clothing, who went to the right services, who knew how to pray the most and the most eloquently, that they were the furthest away from God. And on the other side, Jesus spent his time with those who were broken and lost and empty, those who were lepers and blind, and those who were on the outside on the margins of society. And it was to those people that he said, come and see. But Jesus is lovingly and graciously and compassionately pleading with this audience, stop performing. Stop basing your relationship with God on your performance and come and receive and drink freely from the grace of God. Get off the treadmill of performance. Get off the treadmill of trying to do everything to control your relationship with me. And instead, come and see, come and drink, come and eat, and you will be satisfied in me. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, in the message translation, again, I don't have a slide for this, so please pay attention. Paul, talking about the grace of God, says this, watch what God does. Watch what God does. 
and then do it like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. I'm so grateful to have a godly mom. I get to walk in godliness because my mom modeled that for me. And those of you who have grandparents and uncles and aunts and parents who have laid the path in front of you, aren't you grateful for that legacy that you have? And parents, you have an awesome responsibility in front of you. Not to be perfect, but to point your son, to point your daughter to this prodigal father who is lavishly grace-filled and is willing to spend it all to bring your kids back. Watch what God does and then do it, like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does, mostly what God does is love you. Do you feel the love of God this morning? Some of you are just starting to get it, and that's okay. And you don't have to say yes. But when you think about God, do you think about God's love or do you think about God judging? As we talked about last week, God will judge and God will bring judgment and God will bring, he's holy, all those things are true. But primarily God's orientation is love. Do you feel the love and the approval of your father today? God is love. Mostly what God does is love you. So keep company with him and learn to live a life of love. Observe how Christ has loved us. His love was not cautious. Amen? If God's love was cautious, he would have never taken the prince of heaven, the son of God, and executed him. It was extravagant to the point of death that the son went to the cross and the father commissioned the son to bleed out, to breathe his last breath, to extravagantly bring us back. He didn't love us in order to get something from us. Like every other relationship we have, it's always a transactional relationship, even in the best marriages, even with the best parents and, and kids relationship, even with people that you love as friends. God didn't do that just so that you would do something for him. But he did it to give everything of himself to us. And I want you to listen carefully, parents. Listen carefully, spouses. Listen carefully, those who are dating. Listen carefully, those who have fathers and grandfathers and aunts and uncles. Those of you who have neighbors and roommates. Love like that. Love extravagantly, not cautiously. A lot of us, we protect. Protect our time, protect our money, protect our influence, that we don't want to give away too much because then we'll get tired or then we'll, we'll give away too much, we'll have nothing left. And and I understand there's wisdom in there somewhere, but we've got to love extravagantly because God loved us like that. God so loved the world that he gave his one, his only son. When you're thinking about dinner parties, don't put out ramen. Ramen's great. Think about blessing your neighbor. Think about blessing the new immigrant family in your, in your neighborhood. Think about extravagantly putting together a three or five or seven course meal. Think about the details. Be extravagant in how you're hospitable. Think about extravagance with your kids and extravagance to model the very grace of God. So as I get ready to close, you guys have been amazing. This is a hard message to hear, but here's what I'd like you to do in response to today's message. Number one, I want you to get right with God. If you are on this side of the room and you literally are a runner and you have never received the grace of the Father through Jesus Christ, I would love for you to pray and invite, your, invite yourself because you've already been invited to the table to open the doorway of your heart to this Father who provided a son to die the death that you deserve to die. Maybe you feel exhausted. Maybe you feel empty. Maybe you've tried all this other stuff, but you've never allowed the love of God and the grace of God to meet you. And on the other hand, maybe you're a performer and this message is messing with you because for your whole life you thought, well, I go to church and I read my Bible when I can and, and I, I know scripture and I do this and I do that, but maybe you've never actually opened up your heart and understood that you too need, desperately need the grace of God. Because at the end of the day, God's not gonna look at your moral scorecard. He's gonna ask this question. Did you receive my son? Did you open up your heart to my son? Did you welcome his forgiveness? Did you welcome his grace? Did you worship my son or did you worship your rules and your tradition? So if you're not right with God, would you 
take this opportunity. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. Today would be the day that you would put religion aside, put your wayward living aside, and instead come to the table and drink freely from the grace of God. Secondly, if you're already right with God, are you right with others? Are you right with your spouse? Are you right with your kids? Are you right with your neighbors? I would love for you to think about your marriage if you're married. I would love for you to think about your kids if you're a parent. I would love for you to think about your neighbors if primarily you're in that season of life and you've got roommates. But we just talked about modeling the love of God and God's love was extravagant. So are you loving your spouse extravagantly, lavishly, recklessly even? Are you creating ex experiences around the dinner table and places in your home with, of extravagance, of generosity? Are you opening your home, opening a, a place at your table for people to come and see and to experience the love of God? What our city desperately needs, and that's how it ties into the series, is that we need to model what it looks like to follow a prodigal God. We need to be trophies of the grace of God who have come to Christ, not because of our performance, but because Jesus was the perfect son of God, who was the lamb of God, who took on my sin, who took on my pride, who took on my self-worship, who took on my self-discovery, and he did it with humility and he opened up his heart. And on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They're prodigals. They don't even know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. They've been trying to earn their way to God on their own and by themselves their whole life. Forgive them. Forgive the Pharisees who are spitting on me right now. Forgive the Pharisees who put me here on the cross. Forgive Judas for being a betrayer. Forgive Peter for being the one who was willing to turn me aside for a 13-year-old girl. So are you right in, your, in relationship with your spouse, with your kids? Here's a good question. How can you extend prodigal love this week? How can you be recklessly extravagant in your love for people this week? Not holding out, not just giving out a little morsel at a time, but just opening it up and just saying, God, if this is how you want me to love, that you're going to provide the resources. You're going to provide the endurance. You're going to provide the wisdom. You're going to provide the food in order to do it. City Church, since its beginning, since it was a seed before we even started this movement and rented this facility, since the very beginning, we have endeavored, endeavored, not perfectly, we have endeavored to be a church where prodigals could come home and a place where the older brothers could finally get off the treadmill, to get off the stage and come at the expense of God's grace and not because of their effort. City Church was founded for people who are wayward, who have wasted their life and wasted opportunities and wasted their parents' opportunities. And it's also been a place for people like me who are recovering older brothers who have tried to control God by their actions and by their performance and by their morality. What our city needs is free food in the atrium. It's coffee. It's signage. It's a place where everybody that you and I love and know in the city to come and see, to come and eat, to come and drink at the banquet table of Jesus himself, to push a, Religion's important. Don't get me wrong. All this stuff is important. Singing's important. The word of God's important. And sacrifice is important. Giving's important. Serving's important. We know all that. But why it's important is because we're trying to point people to this prodigal father. He's been gracious with us, and he is gracious with the people who are sleeping off a hangover right now. He's been gracious with us, and he's, been, he's going to be gracious with a person who's finally going to repent and come through these doors and hear a message or see people like you who have been recklessly affected by the grace of God. So I'm going to invite you once again to recommit yourself to building a kind of family, a kind of community, a kind of church where everybody no matter if they're a runner or a performer, can come and see. They can see Jesus. Not a pastor, not a singer, not a bunch of rules and rituals and traditions. All those things are important. 
but we want people to see Jesus on the cross and Jesus in the empty tomb. We want, to, we want them to know that no matter what their background is, that they have a seat at the table if they will only come and accept the grace of God. Amen? Unlike a fairy tale, this parable presents no happy endings. A lot of movies today don't have happy endings, and I hate that, don't you? Jesus, 2,000 years ago, told a story with no happy ending. This story does not have a happy ending. At the end, we're left wondering, will the older brother come in? And instead, the, the older brother is mad, he's angry, he's resentful, he's pleading, the father's pleading, come in and celebrate, come and eat, come and drink. And instead, the older brother's got his arms crossed, refusing to come in, dishonoring his father publicly, and we're left with this question. Will the older brother be saved? That's the question I want to leave with you today. Will you pray with me? The most important thing that we can do right now is if you are not a follower of Jesus, if you have not received the grace of God, if you've tried to go through the law of performance, today, would you just get off the treadmill and come to Jesus? Maybe you have wasted opportunities and wasted your life. Maybe you've tried to find happiness and find hope and find the good life apart from God. Today, you too have an opportunity to come and drink freely. So if you've never made that decision, I'm gonna invite you with every head bowed and every eye closed. This is a holy moment between you and God. I'm just gonna ask you, when I pray this prayer, if that's the intention of your heart to walk through the door of salvation today, nobody can make you, God himself can't make you open the door. You have to decide to open the door. And if that's your decision, I wanna invite you just to raise your hand so that we can acknowledge you, that we can try to put resources into your hands. And we always wanna remind you that we are a church that wants to share life with you. Don't do this alone. You need to get into a group. You need to get discipled. You need to find out all these things about God that we're just beginning to find out for ourselves. So let's pray. Let's pray for those who are making this holy decision online and in person right now. Father, we bow before you and we thank you that you are a reckless father, that you gave everything when you gave your son to us that he was born to a virgin named Mary. He was born in a poor family. He was born in a really forgotten village. And Jesus, you spent most of your life in obscurity. And you literally gave your life to the world by teaching and by healing, but most importantly, through your death. That Jesus, on the cross, that you paid for our sin, you paid for our rebellion, you paid for the prodigals to come home and for the elder brothers to finally become a son. So Father, look over your daughters and son today. Look over those who have not become a son or a daughter right now. And if it's your intention today to settle once and for all, if you have a place at the table, I wanna invite you to lift your hand as a, as a sign that you wanna follow Jesus. You don't wanna follow religion. You don't wanna join a church that you wanna follow Jesus. You wanna receive the grace of God. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up briefly so we can acknowledge you? And God, for those of us that just needed this fresh reminder that God, you're such a good father. You're such a generous father. Father, would you again open up our hearts to receive your grace? Would you help us to love like you do? Would you help us to have wisdom as parents to freely give? God, would you help us as spouses not to compare our spouses to another person or to wish they were different, but instead to love them exactly as you had made them. Help us to serve at home. Help us to serve at work. Help us to serve in our neighborhood. Father, would you create spaces in our homes and spaces at our tables to be lavishly generous just God, as you've been generous with us through Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would transform us as individuals so that as a church family, together, we could bring heaven to Montreal. Heaven to Montreal around our dinner tables, around our homes, around this place where we worship freely every Sunday. God, we ask for grace for our next generation right now that you would fill our kids with hearts to serve you. Not kids that feel like they have to perform, but kids that understand that God, you freely gave and they can freely receive. God, give parents wisdom 
for those who have teenagers right now. God, it is difficult. It needs a, a tremendous amount of wisdom and endurance. So Father, help us as fathers, help us as mothers, help us as uncles and aunties and, and people here in this church to not try to manipulate our kids or control our kids through outward performance, but instead to point them to Jesus. May our kids, may our teenagers understand grace more than we ever have. May they be fueled by grace and led by grace, not to do whatever they want to do, but instead to be a servant of the Most High God. So Father, we thank you for how we've learned today. Holy Spirit, we need your help. Jesus, you told us a story that the seeds of God, they can be easily taken away from Satan himself. And so we pray that every seed that was planted into the soil of our hearts, that God, that you would allow them to grow and harvest. I pray that they would be 30 or 60 or 100 times of what this message could ever do in 30 or 40 minutes. God, grow us to understand and appreciate grace. May it be the fuel in our veins. May it be the, the blood that pumps through our hearts. May we be led and live by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.